not in here. All right, so um, we're going to get started with our um, sort of keynote in conversation, except that our keynote already was a conversation. Um, I think just another hand for our uh, keynote speakers. Um, And I also want to give a hand to Trish, who really helped uh, coordinate, Yay! introduce, um, and help sort of make this sort of new format of a keynote um, possible. Um, so again, I'm Rob Weisberg, one of the program co-chairs. And, um, and again, we're, this is about what we do when we get back to our institutions. So I want to start, actually, with one of the questions that had been um, left over from uh, the many Slido questions, and applause to all of you for yes. making Slido work, yeah. uh, too. Um, what is being a co-conspirator, what does being a co-conspirator look like day to day, and what does it look like in attempting to subvert museum power dynamics and hierarchy? Mm. So uh, what I'd like to throw out to you guys is, what are some steps that people can take, concrete steps that people can take when they get back to their institution to be this kind of co-conspirator and to actually make change start to happen? So, you know, we're, can y'all hear me? We are museum people. What we love to do is research and learn and study. So that's what I would have anyone do when they go back, is to literally just <laughs> get on your computer, your device, whatever you got to use, and read about things like intersectionality, read about oppression, read about um, just anything, any question that you have, ask it and see what answers come up. Do some kind of investigation and critical research, uh, critical race theory. I mean, all these things um, are there for us. Um, and just kind of start on your own personal journey of, of trying to fill in your knowledge gaps. That's usually what I do. If, if there's something that I want to try to tackle, I try to find resources that, that feel credible, that feel um, good, and, and just say, what, do I, what don't I know? And try to start filling in the gaps from there. Um, it's that internal, personal work that's going to help you more than anything. Um, and then taking it on in your daily life, OK? And it's hard. It's really hard. Um, I'm not going to even act like it's easy, because I, I, I confront biases all the time. And it's not easy. But um, in the end, it, it helps. It makes you a better person. And so when you become uh, you know, more tuned into that mm -hmm. um, and become a more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? just a better human, <laughs> then your work will reflect that, that humanity. You, you, you can't help but have it reflect in your work. Yeah, I think you'll bring more thoughtfulness and care to your work. Mm -hmm. I'd also add listening. Yes. I, I think people don't listen, and furthermore, they don't listen intentionally. And I mean, listen to everyone, I mean, from well, this may not apply to you, but I live in New Jersey, so I'm going to get onto the subway and listen, like listen to the people on the train, listen to the people as you're getting your coffee, listen to the barista, because they may not say something directly to you about race, but like that interaction will tell you something mm -hmm. that you probably have been missing. And that from that interaction, you can learn how to take care of a certain situation. So I think listening and paying attention and acknowledging people is really important. And then trying, like you have to actually try and you're gonna fail, somebody's gonna be mad at you, you're gonna have to apologize and you're gonna have to get back up and try again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, and that's, that touches on the point I was going to make. Don't, don't let failure be an excuse. Um, you are not going to get it right all the time um, when either you are, you know, diversifying your media diet to become more informed or you're going to uh, the sources, you're going to activists, you're going to people who are doing this kind of work to understand how do you, can, you can incorporate it into what you do a lot better. You are not going to get it right all the time. And you have to be okay with not getting it right. And you have to be OK with people telling you that you're not getting it right. And that, I think, I think it's just it's a basic function of critical thinking mm -hmm. that you know, I'm confident that everyone in this room possesses. Yeah. Um, but I, 
I think that you know has become a little bit too rare. Um, people get wrapped up in their feelings. People, you know, get insecure about you know what they know, what they don't know, mm -hmm. and you know, just understanding that, like you said, like like Andrea said, it's about learning, and it's about just trying to um, be more effective. If you're interested in actually being more effective, understand that there's a process, you know, that you're gonna have to perhaps undergo in order to do that. Yeah, and that's really hard. I know it for museum people. Like, we spend years, years, literal years, becoming experts in subject areas and getting everything 100% right, right? You don't want to put anything out there that might be considered even the slightest bit incorrect. So it's, it's hard to resist that, especially if you're a trained museum. It's hard to resist that training, um, but it's okay. You know, we know that there's humans behind the work and we know that not every organization is perfect. And the institution that comes out and says, we stepped in it and we're sorry, I'm a fan forever. I'm just gonna be like that. I'm, I know that you're not afraid of, of making mistakes right. and then amending, making amends for your mistake. But too few of the organizations are willing to do that because we're just so fully trained on being you know, infallible subject experts. So I know that's hard to resist. Do we have any uh, questions from Trish? <laughs> I feel like if you're in this room, you're probably a, you know, that step closer to being a co-conspirator. A lot of, uh, I think, of what we experience here in institutions and taking action, um, we wish we could bring someone into this room that might not have looked up, you know, from our institution. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd love to hear your input on methods that you've heard that have worked to uh, enroll or somehow educate someone who's not going out of their way. Doing it. So I was like, I didn't care. I was just like, I'm gonna shame you. <laughs> public shame, public shame is a big, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great. I mean, it's, if, if it's not good, it's effective. Yeah, it's effective. Um, Cause I mean, for a long time when I was in museums, you know, I had a, a very, what, you know, would be considered a subordinate position. You know, I was an admin for an education department that had four or five different areas. I had like six different bosses. I mean, it was just really hard, but I would always, you know, try to use what I could. So if something wasn't going right in our education program and I had parents coming to me saying, I don't like this, this teacher said this thing to my child and I'm upset, and I would just be like, I cannot treat the children this way. You know, I mean, you have to find some way to appeal to something. Or do you realize that this person is connected to this family and if they go outside and they say this thing, you're gonna be in hot water? I mean, it's, it's just all these little nuggets I would just drop. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm gonna use whatever tool I can think of mm -hmm. to push that progress forward. Um, it's real radical and, mm -hmm. and at some point I had to just say, you know, I don't care. I'm, I'm supposed to be here for, you know, these kids in our program, these people that come in our, that's what you tell me I'm supposed to do. Um, so prove to me that you're here for the same reasons I'm here. Or I would go into things like the mission. And I'd be like, well, I was looking at the mission statement and it said, you know, <laughs> you know the vision statement says that we're supposed to do this, but we did this. Um, like, yeah, you I gotta, found you that that's with it. been effective. Mm -hmm. Like, if we're truly doing what our mission says or we consider that we're human-centered museums and all of this great stuff, that usually is effective sometimes. Yeah. And then I'm just persistent. Yeah, like, I'm just a pain in the ass. I will, <laughs> <laughs> in the past, I just kept submit, submitting the same exhibit proposal. Like, I'm like, you all are gonna see this. If you don't <laughs> accept it, you're just gonna keep seeing it year <laughs> after year. So, <laughs> we're going to do this exhibit on mass incarceration. At some point. <laughs> In some it's like form. the Blues Brothers in the restaurant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, that's an old it. reference. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I'm old. I got that one. I'm glad someone got that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way to do it. Uh, is there anything else from? Uh, yeah. Just, just a follow up to that. Since mm. your impression is also a super effective tool, could you guys give some examples of organizations that you think are doing a really good job on this front? Peer mm. pressure. One of the things I just finished it, uh, was the, the mass action uh, conference in Minneapolis. Um, 
and some people in this room were there with me, so that's awesome. Um, but if, <laughs> we first started doing that two years ago. It's a, museums are sites with social action, so it's a way of, of, of preparing your sites and your employees to be places where you can have these kinds of um, discussions and discourse and, and just changing from an internal cultural perspective. Um, the first year we did it, you know, people were just like, eh, what's that? Um, and then the people who went, went back and said, such a great time that a lot of museums like have that you know FOMO right so it's like fear of missing out um, so you, you I would always try to play at the angle of you know look what Mia's doing look what they're doing at the Detroit Institute of Arts do you want to be the last one to get on this train yeah. you know this is that's the peer pressure um, and sometimes the people are really just there to say well we just want to look good and that's okay if you're doing the work and it's having an effect I don't care about that um, and some people really are taking it to heart and they're saying, we want to change inside. And, and the people that don't, I'm, I promise you, they will fall off. They're going to get left behind because at some point they're going to become a liability to your organization and somebody will figure out a way to get rid of them. That's just real talk. Um, but yeah, just pointing out those two places I like a lot for the, way, the ways that they're handling this. And, and you know, in terms of like, taking cues from my business, um, weeding people out who don't get it um, and or I think is, it, it may seem like sort of a relative, you know, somewhat of a violent measure, you know what I mean? Um, but you kind of have to do it, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? You, you don't have time to wait for people who are resistant to the kinds of changes that you need in order to be yeah. successful. Um, there are plenty of people out here who are training and who are looking for work um, or maybe work someplace else that you could use mm -hmm. that you can find to help you in your missions. So don't, don't waste time with people who are impediments, you know? And I think that that's, uh, it may sound harsh, but that's just being real. Mm -hmm. It's true. And I think when we waste, and I'll say waste, because I do think it is a waste um, to waste time on people who are impediments, like we're exhausting so much energy that we could pour into elevating the people who are already doing the work. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. always my purview. It's like my pension is to elevate people who are already doing the work. And if we're so worried about converting this person or pushing this person, you're going to miss out on developing this talent over here. Mm -hmm. Just to sort of follow up on that, though, so what are some what are some methods sort of internally, institutionally to do that elevation? Is it something you do informally by sort of reaching out to people and you know, connecting with them? Or is it something that you sort of, you find a way sort of within the institution uh, to do? Because that's a refrain that, that I know I've said and I know a lot of people say is that, you know, I, I know people here who, who are doing the right thing, but we're doing it informally because our, our institution is, um, structured, you know, even, even the best thing, structured in a way that, that makes that hard. So what is your thoughts about? Yeah, I personally think that the structures have to change. Like, they have to make room for these projects to, like, make sense to happen at their institution, meaning that there needs to be a budget. There needs to be, like, it needs to be staffed. Um, there's like some of the projects that I mentioned earlier, um, just Nikhil since he's sitting right in front of me, museums of color, like that could, or visitors, sorry, visitors of color, um, that could very well be a project housed in an institution and be funded, be funded <laughs> and be staffed because it's an incredible project. Mm -hmm. um, so museums, and I think they're going to risk like irrelevancy if yeah. they don't start reconceptualizing what we can do. Because I think that we've seen, like with all of these projects, that there's so many innovative things happening outside of like the actual museum space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that the, like touches on a key point is that if people come to museums expecting only that they're going to be seeing stuff from the past, it's going to feel less and less relevant. You have to find ways to engage with people's present, with their current situations, and also a diversity of situations. So when we were talking about centering whiteness before, you know, it's, it's not just about say, hey, I don't see a person of color on the wall, you know, or I don't see uh, you know, enough you know, of my 
people and uh, you know reflected in a particular exhibit it's about you know understanding that they don't it's it goes to the source you know what i mean it, it, you can understand like you could tell and especially in journalism when there is not there hasn't been an editor of color in the room you know um, when the, the present realities of a diverse people are not being reflected through choices that you know you see on the front page or what have you. And I think the same is true of museums. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a staff that is in, you don't necessarily have to have like, you know, 50-50, that obviously that would be great, you know, have a great diverse staff. But even if you don't, the responsibility, you can't wait for it to hire enough black people or enough Latino people uh, or enough Native American people you know, so that you can finally engage in <laughs> the work. <laughs> You know what I mean? You have to take this up for your, uh, on yourselves, and you have to do it now. And if you have to, um, you know, take upon yourself, you know, more education about what the, what is going on in the world, and, and 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 figure out what's what's how better to reflect the present through whatever exhibits or projects or presentations that you may have, then that's what you have to do. And it, you know, no one likes to be told you have to do more homework, <laughs> but. You do. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, of policy and procedure. This is the thing that I always had to focus on when I was in working in museums. And I'm all for like putting it down in words and, and making these things core values and core concepts of your department, of your organization, of your volunteer committee, whatever it is. If it's part of that, that narrative of your institution, then that means everyone who works within the institution, everyone who's contracted to come into the institution, has to be held to that standard. Um, a lot of this stuff is real nebulous. We say, oh, we think we should do this, we're trying to do that. Put it down on, you know, in a very tangible place. When somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to work with you, you slide it over and you say, hey, this is our core standards, this is our code of conduct, and this is how we treat people inside and outside of our institution. And so therefore, when it's HR time and everybody's looking to get their raises at the end of the year, and they're going through whatever probably archaic system that they have to, to rate you, that's going to be part of your evaluation. Right. Did you follow these core concepts, these core values? And I've, I've not seen that once. If anyone knows of a museum or, or a science, whatever, that does that as an, at an HR level, I'd love to see it. Because in the corporate world, those are part of evaluation. Um, but they're not in nonprofits that I've seen right. so far. Yeah, I mean, like, even the American Alliance for Museums, we don't have some, like, metrics for understanding. And diversity and inclusion is, like, a really nebulous term yeah, that kind of doesn't mean anything. But, like, <laughs> like, we don't even have the, like, when we, museums go up for accreditation, that's not one of the measures not that, consideration. right. Um, your security, think, though. Is your security good? Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. We've got we've got metrics. Right. Are your, are your collections, collections great? taken care of? Yes. Are you okay. taking care of your people? Eh, we don't worry about that. <laughs> don't worry about that. Um, I think the statement that I've seen by APAC hmm. is pretty good. I don't know. They have like a value statement, and I'm not even sure they refer to it as that. But I'm not sure how much weight it has in who's hired, who's not, or who's advanced and who's not. But I think that they use really direct, specific, and incisive language, okay. which is what we need. Like, we can't just keep having these documents that say diversity, inclusion, kindness, creativity. Like, we need like specific <laughs> language to address yeah. what we're dealing with today. Any questions from uh, the audience? Right there.
I mean, you're going to have those competing frameworks, which is, is unfortunate because these are organizations that are financially, you know, invested, right? So, you know, they're going to want to try to make some kind of return on their investment, which in the museum world, I've always was like, how do we quantify that? We, you know, we talk about those kinds of things all the time. Um, but yeah, I see your point about that because now you're trying to, you're getting to this area where you're thinking of people as like, you know, a commodity. Um, so you have to resist that, that framing. Um, and it is exhausting, but just know that, you know, nobody can do that 24 seven. Like, I mean, you have to take some time and, and make sure that you're caring for yourself. Um, and if you, if you build kind of coalitions within your organization or even people at other organizations, you can kind of parcel out that responsibility and you know, they can step up when you want to fall back. Um, and, and, just, and just asking those questions, if that comes up to you during a conversation where you, you think, are we talking about people or are we talking about cattle? You know, I mean, what are we, you know what I mean? What are we talking about? So I mean, just that, those little prods and pokes you can do. Um, but I mean, that's the best tax of it is that we are talking about organizations that want to stay financially solvent. But like I mentioned before, if you stay on this current path of just ignoring what's happening, of censoring whiteness, of pushing heteronormativity, these, you're going to find yourself out of a job. I mean, people vote with their feet. Um, they, they are not going to want to come into a place like that. And I'm personally in favor of some of these organizations being gone. Mm. I mean, I don't, I don't, I hate that people will lose their jobs, but some of them are just so entrenched in this, this is the kind of violent framework that I don't think they're ever going to get out of it. Um, and any person who's in that framework trying to make it better is going to be under siege, and I don't know how you can stay in it and stay healthy. Sorry, that's a bummer answer. <laughs> <laughs> a question? Up front? Well, I'd start by saying I don't think it's disingenuous for you. I mean, if the kid was there. Yeah, right? I mean, he, was he actually part of the program? Yeah. Wasn't like a stunt kid, right? I'm like, okay. You didn't get him off like, like you know. <laughs> off Craigslist or something. Right, it's like stockimages.com or something. Um, no. So you're telling the truth. The kid Happy was Black there. Kid he... at Museum. Um, no, Dr. JPEG. Um, like. <laughs> in all seriousness, though, I think, you know, I think it's good because if I'm coming to Maine, Mm -hmm. You know, I see, okay, well, there's, you know, it's not just white people here. It is. That's, it's all and, right. and that matters. It just does. You know what I mean? Like, you see, it's a college brochure. You know, you see mm -hmm. that, you know, there's the smiling pictures of everybody in their college sweatshirt, and it looks like a Benetton ad, and it's like, <laughs> okay, you know, it gives you a little bit of a skewed reality of what right. college is actually like, but uh, it, it tells you that at least, okay, I belong in this space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is the baseline. Yeah, you know, that's the and, least uh, you can do, literally. You know, literally, it's the least <laughs> you can do is making sure that people understand that they belong in that space. Mm -hmm. So you may not be able to do a whole lot necessarily about the diversity of your staff, given wh where you live or what have you, but I think it only increases the onus upon you to make sure, you know, not to say like, okay, guys, we're going to talk about race. No, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know? But I think that what you can do is just make sure you're conscious of, I mean, first of all, educate yourself about ways that, you know, first of all, current events, everything that's going on, so that you can understand, okay, this thing that's happening in the world right now, this particular project or exhibit, what have you, is applicable. You know, there's something that's going on that I could be, we could tie this in, and we can help people understand this a little bit better within their current events context. Just be conscious of this stuff, you know what I mean? Like that. You don't necessarily have to bring it up. It doesn't necessarily have to be an awkward conversation. Mm -hmm. um, you can just be conscious of integrating these realities into what you do. And 
the, that's, it starts with you. You know, it doesn't have to be any, you don't have to wait for anybody else to get it. You know, just, just make sure that, you know, you're, you're on top of things. I think staying, I mean, obviously, you know, given what I do, I think staying informed is an American duty. Mm. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it's not just so you can have, you know, productive conversations at, you know, at the dinner table or at, or at cocktail parties. It's so that you can incorporate what you learn in the news, in the, in the political world, into what you do. Mm. And so that you can, you know, hopefully make, thing, make this a better world through what you do. And I, 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 there's no reason you can't start now. Yeah, I mean, I think the most immediate thing which is probably gonna happen is that when you go back to your institution, your colleagues are gonna say, how was the conference? And you can say, I went to this keynote where three black people <laughs> talked to me about race. Um, so, but that's, that's a simple situation, but it's really just like naming what actually happened. Mm -hmm. right. I actually worked at an institution that was pretty much all white. I was the only black person there. There were a few other people of color, not in curatorial though. Um, and I just consistently named it when it came up. Right. Like I was very honest, like what happened this weekend? And I would say, you know what? I got pulled over this weekend <laughs> for no reason. I was just driving in a place that I didn't belong. Um, so I think you can do the same thing It's just like being very honest and naming racialized situations instead of, which I think tends to happen in very white spaces where like things happen, but people don't name it or bring attention to it and everyone just like watches it go away. Mm -hmm. oh, that's uh, um, there was this person a couple rows back. Can we talk about <laughs> Credentialing. Oh my God! How long y'all got? <laughs> right. Ooh, that's a big one. Um, I did not come into uh, museum work from like a traditional. I'm not. I didn't train as a curator. Um, my undergraduate degree was in nonprofit leadership studies, and so I knew I wanted to work in a nonprofit. I knew I loved art, um, and so I applied for a job in my hometown art museum. This is really quite, you know, idyllic. But um, the process I had to go through for a job that was an admin position that probably would only require a couple of years of junior college maybe, I mean, it was really too much. Like, it was four interviews in person, two on the phone, um, writing samples. I mean, it was so many hoops that when I finally got to the work, I thought, this is it? Like, I, I mean, I really thought that, you know, it was going to be something super rigorous or whatever. And not that the work wasn't challenging or hard, but it just did not require the level of intense uh, work. That hiring practice was brutal. I mean, I have to say that. And so, I mean, I had that position for six years. And then in that six years, I had educated myself, you know, to a higher level of education. So when I left that position and I saw what they had written up to fill it, they were like, we want you to have a master's degree in museology. And I was like, what? No, it's still the same work. So, I mean, we have a problem with over-credentialing uh, for jobs that don't require it. It's yeah. just not important. Um, yeah. And then when I worked in another museum as a program manager, we were trying to hire a curator. They kept saying, we want the PhD, we want this, we want that. And I'm like, but here's a person who has written critically about art for 10 years. They're, they're very well educated. They're connected to the region. We need that more than, oh, I got my PhD in this and that, but I've never known anything about art. I don't, right, you know, right. so it's or like, even don't do like it. like certain, um, I would say, pipelines, people oh. are more apt to look at candidates from museum studies mm -hmm. or public history or mm -hmm. what have you. But like, in all reality, people who study African American studies would be just as qualified, but yeah. there's yeah. like this, really rigid system yeah. about how we hire. There's this, like, I think, field-wide insecurity about the work that is reflected in the way we hire. 
You know, we know that people don't value our work the way we do, so we want to prove that our work has merit. Yeah. So we want it to be academically rigorous and da-da-da, but I mean, the people that show up to those programs and that can afford to train themselves in this way that we're requiring are not gonna be reflective of what's happening across this community. That's just not the case. I mean, like I said, I mean, I kind of backdoored my way into it. It's a total humbug. I mean, and so I, I don't know if I didn't have like just the personal drive to do it, how that they would have ever reached me. And they would have never they found me. Went, they didn't they went, come, uh, my, my organization, yeah. my college was in the middle of the city. I literally could look out of the fine arts building and see that museum on the hill. I mean, it's across the park. And they never came to a job fair. They never sent representatives down. They didn't have a, a cooperative education agreement with us like they did with other institutions. So they would have never found me or anyone like me. So, I mean, we're doing it to ourselves. I'm just going to say this. I mean, we're trying to figure out what's wrong. And it's us. Yeah. <laughs> we're the problem. Right. It's nobody else. So you have to diversify where you look for right. hires. Just think, think. And the types of skills. Yes. I mean, you can get some of the skills that we value outside of mm -hmm. museum studies programs. Yeah. And so we should look at broader fields. Yeah. I mean, think about how when someone is hired in, the amount of time and effort and money you have to put into training them to learn your system of operating, you can teach that to anyone. I mean, there's nothing that I could, I mean, I've looked at museum studies programs. My husband went through an MBA where he did a whole section on it. And I thought, yeah, that's everything I learned after I got hired. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that can teach you how a place works systemically until you get into that place. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't you want to have a, a variety of right. educations and backgrounds to inform that work? That's what I don't understand. Is yeah. Why do you want everyone in the place to have the same education? and learn the same thing. Right. I never understood that. And if we truly want to be places of curiosity and innovation and yeah. growth, we should have, we should pull from a more diverse background and experiences. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking more broadly, I think it requires a certain bravery. Yeah. Um, you need to be more courageous in seeking people out and understanding that the onus is upon you and not them to find, yeah. you know, find the job. Um, I remember, I mean, just, gosh, I mean, I went to college in Philadelphia, and I had no idea that NFL Films was right there mm. across the, the bridge. And yet, I know people who, when I worked at eventually, ended up at NFL Films as a producer. You know, they interned there in, in, you know, in college. Oh, yeah, yeah, I interned here. Yeah, you didn't know about it? No, I didn't How know about it. Know? No, I didn't know about it. I didn't know about anything film-related, you know, that was nearby. And... I was a person who was actively seeking out those opportunities. And I didn't, I didn't find it, yeah. you know? Granted, there was no Google then, but still, but still you know, I mean, like you, can't, you can't count on diversity and talent and whatnot finding you, you know? The next star at, at, at your business could be in sec, you know, Section 8000 mm -hmm. or community college. Mm -hmm. Or as I was telling someone earlier, in high school right now, yes. go to high schools and let these kids know that these jobs are possible for them. They don't even know that you know no. those jobs exist. No. They, you know what I mean? Really and that's an investment that will pay off for you, long term. You know, and it's a, give those you know get those people something to to to, to think about, some potentially to dream about. Yeah, aspirations. Exactly. And then in five years they could be working for you. You don't know. Yeah, and I mean, and I'm I'm all about you know paying people what they're worth. I, I, this that, this yeah, field, I too. swear, before Jesus, will not pay people what they are worth. We don't put it, all this education. That, I mean, I've got so many student loans on my back right now. It's not even funny, and I don't even work for museums anymore. But I'm still paying for my museum education <laughs> that I had to get in order to work for the museum. You see what I'm saying? So it's like once you get into these places, then you get paid such a low wage that you just will never get out of this right. subsistence living um, because they think that the only value is, oh, you love the work. Okay, but I love to eat, mm -hmm. and I love to have shelter, yeah. and I love to be able to take care of my family too. So any kind of thing where you're trying to like open up a pipeline or diversify your effort has to come with some kind of financial reward. I'm just going to say that. I mean, we're still stuck in a capitalist society. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Well, any, any, <laughs> no, but here's the thing. It's any prestige happen. brand.
becomes a prestige brand when you have the best talent. Yes. And you get the best talent by, by paying, paying for that talent and not depending upon your ability to be a prestige brand for to attract people to work for free yeah. or to work be beneath their uh, beneath their cost right. of living. So that, you know, I think people need to kind of get over themselves a little bit. <laughs> I mean, and, and, you know, you, everybody I'm sure here works for places with stellar reputations, mm -hmm. but you maintain those reputations. You don't rely upon them. Yes. Stop resting on our laurels, museum people. That's we have a question in the front. Yes. Mm. Great. Uh, I'll let y'all start because I'll, I'll go on for days. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I read the typical things like the New York Times, um, Slate, Atlantic. Then I read The Root, um, Boston Review. Uh, what else? I have so many, and I'm just like, Blinking on them now. Um, I'm forgetting the name of the digital publication, but Kimberly Foster is the. Oh, for, oh, for Harriet. Harriet. For Harriet. 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 Yeah, yeah, for Harriet yeah. is like my main one. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like I'm, Bustle probably, and Bitch Media. Yeah, Bitch Media. Um, Salon. Salon is the one. Feminist thing's a good one. Um, I personally have to give up on the New York Times. Every time I read it, it feels like a personal attack. So I just have given up. I mean, I, I see the headlines and I just know that it's gonna be an exercise and frustration. And I'll click it and I'll be like, why did you do that to yourself? Um, <laughs> it's true, especially the arts and culture oh, section. I'm oh, just oh, like, oh, why? Oh um, so yeah, so I mean, it's good to know what those major like yeah. outlets are talking about, but if nothing else, to compare them to something else, you know, what are they missing? Mm -hmm. You know, I almost read it and then I'll go, okay, they missed that whole section. Let me go over here and find the part that they mm -hmm. should have been talking about. Um, so that's, that's what I like. Honestly, I learned so much just from Twitter. I'm not even gonna lie. Like, I will just go through the feed and somebody will drop a link to something that I've never heard of before, but right. it'll, be, yeah. it'll be some amazing voice and I'm just like, why aren't you the one writing for the time, you know? And or now with this 280 character limit, man, <laughs> I expect to see like grade A thesis work happening <laughs> in my feed. It's already like, <sighs> so I mean, that's where I get ideas from. Um, and I, I, yeah, think I really do. Yeah. And actually, like whenever I give a presentation, I thank Twitter because yes. It's really an incubator, at least for me. Like, I usually do find yeah. sources that I probably would have overlooked. And if anything happens, um, if there's any kind of, you know, protests or uprising, I mean, all blessings and thanks to live streamers because they're the ones who are bringing that information yeah. into our home. I mean, even when Ferguson happened, I was sitting four hours away and just watching and, and saying, this is telling me more. And then I'm seeing the news say this thing. And I'm like, but I just saw this happen last night. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just, um, the people that bring you that information are just priceless, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, and I mean, obviously, I read a lot. Uh, any, any writer should read mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. than she or he writes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I, I take the approach of, and it goes back to something I was talking about earlier, um, intellectual honesty. So I follow, I think, well, first thing, not to plug my Twitter, but if you want to go to my Twitter, I curate who I follow very consciously. Um, and I follow people who are, in, you, know, ex you know, who like to explore, who like to engage. Um, but not foolishly, you know what I mean? Like people who pick their, who pick their battles well. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a number of writers specifically who I would recommend, uh, not just sources because, you know, as much as I would, you know, recommend The Atlantic or, you know, a place like, uh, say, you know, 
Vanity Fair, some of the other, mm. the LA Times, which I also write for. Um, you know, universally, there are specific writers I feel like people need to be That's true. Yeah. paying attention to. Yeah. And not just writers, but podcasters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay? Radio hosts, yes. television hosts. Um, you know, I used to work for Rachel Maddow. She's a pretty good source. Mm -hmm. And one of her mantras is increase the amount of useful information in the world. That's what she tries to do. That's the fundamental thing that she's trying to do every night. And I think if you are, if you are smart about how you seek useful information, you're going to find the people who, makes, or, who are doing something out here who are making mm -hmm. sense and who can contribute to your understanding of the issues that are going on around. So I think if I were to recommend quickly just a few people, um, Van Newkirk of uh, The Atlantic, yes. uh, was a stellar journalist, um, uh, Clint Smith, um, who is a PhD candidate um, at Harvard, and he is, writes regularly for The New Yorker, a number of other places, great perspective on a number of things. Um, you know, there's an incredible, Eve Ewing, um, you have, um, just trying to think of some other uh, quickly off the top of my head. Um, those are those are those are not only just good and entertaining follows on Twitter and whatever mediums that they may be on, but also um, you know they're engaging real issues that I think people aren't discussing quite enough. Uh, um, Liliana Segura, who writes about uh, you know prisons, mm -hmm. um, Radley Balco, um, you know. These are, these are people who are engaging stuff that isn't necessarily leading off the 6 p.m. news. Yeah. And that needs to be a part of, of your media diet. Mm -hmm. you know, because even if you don't necessarily have an, of an exhibit that deals directly with what they cover, it will inform you and I think it will encourage you to be more and more curious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more curious you are, the more useful information you will consume. And it, add, it adds something different to those conversations in the office where people sort of throw exactly. out the same sources and you say, oh, well, then there's this other person. Because then, you can, yeah. because then you can also recommend, say, hey, I read this, this study, or, and also academics. Let me also make sure that you, you know, don't just rely upon journalists. You know, there are plenty of academics out here, Blair Kelly, mm -hmm. um, you know, lots of folks out here, Jelani Cobb, mm -hmm. who are out in the public sphere. And, you know, they may do some journalistic work, right. but they are academics, they are researchers, they are trying to you know, dig and you know, delve in this information. Right. So I think that you know, if you want to inf help inform other people around you, be informed yourself. You know, and, and you can send them links, send them studies, and, and also it helps you weed through the crap that a lot of people who think that they know that th what they're talking about try to spit on you. Because if, you, if you're sitting there uninformed, and you know, it's like, well, I saw last night on the news that <laughs> such and so, such and so, such and so. And, and you know, you, if you haven't been informed or you haven't been reading or keeping up, you might be like, well, that person saw the news. I mean, they must be right. Yeah. You never I mean, mind. Oh. You know, yeah. He saw the news, man. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, and in, in, instead, you could be like, well, actually, this, 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 and this, mm -hmm. and you're wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, that's an invaluable thing to be able to do. And, you know, don't sleep on, on your pop culture commentators either. Like, no. I, I, I regularly yeah. follow Black Girl Nerds and right. all their podcasts, yep. um, Nerds of Color, uh, Geeks of Color. Yep. I mean, I'm just a true nerd, right? So, like, everything I like is, a, and they're taking a true, like, intersectional lens to things like right. Star Wars, Star Trek, yep. Marvel, New Universe, all these things that, and they're critically examining and, and writing really good, um, thorough work yep. that takes a, a wide frame. Right. Um, you know, so that's what appeals to me. And so, as we see things like these, these comic book worlds becoming more inclusive and diverse, these are the voices that are telling us. This is what we need, this is what we want, and this is what we're going to demand. Yeah, and yeah. so a lot of that work has been truly radical. I mean, even things like confronting Netflix about the casting of things like Iron Fist um, and not casting a, a, an Asian or an Asian American person. Um, things like Death Note and uh, Ghost in the Shell. I mean, these are things that these yeah. groups of people are pushing, pushing, and changing things systemically 
um, like Oscar So White. I mean, all these things are happening yeah. in so, the world. Yeah. yeah, and if I can just quickly recommend mm -hmm. a couple people. You have April Rain, who did mm -hmm. Oscar So, so White. You have yeah. Ira Madison, Doreen St. Felix, yeah. um, Soraya McDonald, Kelly Carter. These are people who you should be reading. Yeah, Jamie Broadnax is the founder of Black Girl Nerds, so that's yeah. one of my personal Black heroes. Girl Nerds mm -hmm. is a great podcast. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And, you, and you'll mess around friends. and have fun listening yes. to it. Another round. Yeah, just um, another round is amazing. You know what I mean? Uh, they're, they're, you know, like the whole premise of the podcast is like we're going to get drunk while we interview people. <laughs> and they don't, really do, they don't really do that anymore. <laughs> but the, the point is they are two of the – Heaven and, and Tracy are two of the best interviewers mm -hmm. in the game right now, mm -hmm. period. You listen to their interview of Hillary Clinton, it's one of the That's best amazing. over the entire campaign. Yeah. And yeah. it's not just because it's fun to listen to, they asked her real incisive questions. Mm -hmm. And you know, dig, dig deeper, you know what I mean? Like it's just, there's a lot of folks out here in this business, um, in this media business specifically, who are out here just collecting checks. Yeah. And, and they know that they can get by with some very basic um, arguments or, or, or stuff that, you know, conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. Avoid all of that yeah. the best you, you can. I mean, museums are part of this arts and culture conversation. Right. You know, we, we're doing this work and we're invested in it, but when it comes time to, to, to see that in representative media, it's like, where are we? You know, I mean, as being a person from the Midwest and in the center of the, the country, and it's the flyover country or whatever, I mean, it's really, a, a, it's, it's high-key offensive to know that we've put out consistently good and challenging work and no one is checking for us. And so we have to always try to find some way to, to, to get attention um, and to show what kind of good work we're doing. So, like, even within your own, like, bubbles and circles, when you try to think about, well, who should I work with, who should I collaborate with, who can I learn more about, you know, pick some place that you've never been and just dig into it and see who's there and who's doing the work. I mean, we have to learn about everybody on the coast, but no one looks this <laughs> to and, the and, middle. And, and not to continue to answer this question ad infinitum. Sorry. But no, 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 not at all. But I, you bring up something important, which I think should be mentioned, which especially deals with local media um, mm -hmm. that can amplify these issues, which is support your local journalists. Yes. If you find outlets yes. that you like, pay for the journalism that you like, yes. okay? You finally you like a magazine, subscribe to it. You, yes. you, your, your, your newspaper has a firewall, pay for it, mm -hmm. okay? You, it, not saying that it's, it's nothing, but do it. Trust me, you know, the best way to get, get better journalism is to pay for it. Especially with so many people having to, to rely on the AP to write their papers. There's very few I mean, local journalists I, left that can in, survive. Yeah, you see what's happened in cities like my hometown of yeah, Cleveland. Yeah. You know, where the local paper, you know, is printing Associated Press stuff as their headline. And it's like, it's not because they don't want to do the journalism. Mm -hmm. It's just they, they, their, their capabilities are so hamstrung that they yeah. just are not able to be the paper that they once were. Yeah, yeah. That they once were. And no, more local journalists are out of work because of uh, DNA folding. Oh, don't even get me started oh. with that. Oh, no. yeah. I mean, yes. you know, you see billionaire owners who are, you know, or lording over our journalism. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and killing, if you guys didn't hear, this site's called DNA Info and Gothamist, which this, this billionaire owner, the guy who owns the Chicago Cubs, um, just killed because they were trying to unionize their newsrooms. Yeah. And Archi so. Archive, like literally killed, like the, right. the archivist in me just died. And so. Just the heart broke. You know, if you, you know, regardless, you know, whether or not you, you know, we support unions in your politics, whatnot, um, it's important that you support outlets that are trying to unionize. So if you hear of those kinds of drives, LA Times just had one last week, um, you, know, register, you know, trying to get people to sign up for subscriptions so they can show the power of those unions. You know, contribute, play your part. Try to unionize your museum, see what happens. <laughs> 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 That's yes. slacking. Yeah, and as someone who is part of a newsroom that got essentially detonated mm -hmm. when we tried to unionize earlier this year. Yeah. Trust me, it is it's an important thing that's going on right now and you should be paying, paying attention to it. Mm -hmm. I, I just want to throw um, one more pop culture source. Uh, Tumblr is fantastic yes. for um, uh, art, for sort of combinations of you know, mm -hmm. Twitter, but also art, longer form, yes. longer than even 280 characters. But uh, that's a great source <laughs> yes. for pop culture, sci-fi, comics. A lot of people sort of do their own versions of things. Uh, really good sort of short fan fiction. Yeah, um, I was going to start 
write a museum fan fiction. That's what I'll do. Oh. Right. <laughs> there, there's a session for next year. Uh, <laughs> fan I'm fiction fan. slam. Fan fiction slam. Yeah. Let's do it. Do you have more uh, questions? Do you have more questions from the, uh, the group? One over there. Uh, Matt? Hi. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm glad you talked about sort of pop culture and nerd stuff. I mean, I'm uh, a guy who's a little nerd as well. And, and I sort of uh, recognize, I, I mean, I'm sort of just sort of maybe raise my hand in this crowd, maybe. But anyway, uh, is there reason? So I feel like what's happening in the nerd community, it shows promise. You talking about intellectual wars, what have you? No, like the, the, the topics we've been talking about, you know, mm -hmm. the whiteness, and I mean, like, mm -hmm. the idea of whiteness as a fault. I mean, I, that is, tyranny is a fault, something I talk about all the time, and I do actually find that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm all of a sudden thinking about it, like, totally different. That, that, mm -hmm. that's, so there's great stuff happening. I'm just wondering is if there's, what's the prognosis? Is there a way that we can approach this with positivity? With a, with a, is there a light at the end of the tunnel? It's not New Jersey. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that I sort of adopt the Baldwin approach that's like, you know, I'm alive, therefore I'm an optimist. Right. And uh, so I think that we have no choice to be, you know, we have no choice. We have to be optimists. Um, because if you, the alternative, you know, the alternative is what, laziness, you know, inactivity, you know, sloth. And that is exactly what they are hoping that you do. And so we, I think anti-intellectualism, I'm glad you brought up the nerd part of it because anti-intellectualism plays into all of this, you know I mean? Racism, sexism, all these different isms that you, you're trying to combat all thrive on people having as little verified information as mm -hmm, possible, mm -hmm. as little knowledge and little wisdom as possible. This industry is a weapon against that. So use it the best way you can and use technology as a weapon in that, in that, in that battle. And I think, that, you know, we didn't really touch on technology, I think maybe as much as, as we could have, but I think it's, it's an incredibly important thing mm -hmm. to use all of the different innovations um, to help people empathize to help not just inform, but also to touch people's souls. Mm -hmm. You are, you know, and it is, I hate to use the old phrase, but it's, it's a you know, war for hearts and minds. <laughs> it really is. And, you know, when you walk in, you know, say a place like, you know, Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture, and you see, a, you know, the kind of technical, technological things that they've done in there mm -hmm. to convey the experience um, that they're trying to portray, or they're trying to depict, or trying to help you confront. Those, you know, that's, I'm only drawing upon that because I, I had that experience re relatively recently. But those are the kinds of things that will, are, are weapons in the fight. You know what I mean? And as far as a prognosis, I mean, the, the world is what you make of it. You know, uh, we, could, we could sit around predicting that, you know, obviously predictions a year ago today didn't really do much so, you know, I, I, I don't know if we should spend our time predicting, we should spend our time acting. And so figure out what you can do best. What are your skill sets? Continue to get more informed and put that into action. And, you know, whatever war battles that we're talking about, there will be one. You know, there are more people out here who crave intellectual depth than those that who don't. And I think we should never forget that. I don't know. I mean, I'm an optimist in the sense that I acknowledge the work that is being done and appreciate it and benefit from it. 
but I'm also a historian. <laughs> and <laughs> historians typically aren't optimists because, well, in my field of African American history, what we've seen is that when there's gains, they are usually met with white resistance, mm -hmm. right? And I don't necessarily see that that is a discouraging factor. I just think that it's something that we should be aware of. And I think that as long as we are aware and we are informed, then we can be optimistic because we know how to like address it. But when people aren't aware of that trend of like gains, civil rights gains, and then they're met with resistance, like it happens every few years, it's a cycle that goes on. Um, when people aren't aware of it, then that's when I am concerned. So all right, that's the best way that I can answer that. Yeah, I mean, we're living under the regime of one right now. Yeah. I mean, everything that it's, we're experiencing politically now is a, is a reaction to, to the progress of having the last eight years. The last eight years and having a person in office who was not white. Um, so everything, I mean, when, when that person steps in their office the first day and the reaction is, how can we make this person a one term? Mm. How can we beat back? And then once they get in, how can we dismantle everything that was done? That's the pattern. And it's, it's done on a higher scale and it's done on a smaller scale. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's a really interesting pattern. Like, I, I worked in a place where, like Aaliyah, I was the only black person and was brought in to like, perform a certain kind of blackness. And when that didn't happen, it was, well, how can we get her out of here? And now that organization is back to being all white again. So, I mean, it's, it's, you can, yeah, you can it's see it. <laughs> it's just as and implodes. I think it's very critical. And I, I don't like to like bash people's hopes, but I do think that like, especially in museums, we have this tendency to like, let's look for the positive or let's look, like acknowledge this change that happened. But in reality, we need to take a much longer view to completely understand systems. Like one change is important, but now you need to understand that you're going to have to sustain that change and fight for that change. Yeah. Um, you simply can't be satisfied with the good. Rights are elastic, right? Mm -hmm. They stretch and move, they're malleable, but like we have to understand that there's going to be a challenge to those rights. Yeah. That's fundamental. Like if you're going to engage this work, you have to understand that you will get a gain and move forward and then you have to understand that there's gonna be pushback and you have to be ready to fight for it to sustain it. Yeah, and I think that I'm optimistic when there's people who take that view. I'm not optimistic when there's people who, who don't realize that there's a fight ahead because that means that they're not prepared to fight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, when we started talking about the, the keynote discussion and the theme, um, and people on the program committee um, who are here remember that um, we were talking about the term bravery and sort of how to work that into the theme. And one of the questions was sort of personal bravery versus institutional bravery and sort of what do, what do those mean? And I think a lot of people can probably visualize themselves um, taking one of these steps or speaking out in a meeting or something mm -hmm. and then just sort of get maybe that kind of reaction, fear of that reaction, that instant, like what am, you know, how could I possibly mm -hmm. um, speak up in that meeting. So um, since we have about uh, 10 minutes, nine, 10 minutes left, um, is there any, is there any, um, when we talked about bravery, um, what's that sort of first step that people, that people take sort of personally, sort of as personal bravery to um, maybe then start to build some kind of institutional bravery and as people have been in these, inst these institutions, um, I mean, you had said listen uh, and just sort of keep at, keep at it and keep doing it. Um, is that where it starts, sort of just taking yeah. that first act? I think listening, persistence, and to actually do it, like make up in your mind what you're going to do, whether it's pitch an exhibit idea, um, 
ask for funds to require some new artifacts, whatever it is, make up your mind that you're going to do it. Um, because I think that sometimes we make such a big deal out of something that we might actually be able to convince someone on. Um, like, for example, even with Museums Respond to Ferguson, it was wildly different than what was populating the digital space for museums, right, at the time. And there were people who have stuck with us. Like, <laughs> but we had to be brave and courageous to actually do it. And then we found out, I mean, yes, there are naysayers, there are people who push back, but there are actually people who have stuck with the chats and are very excited. And so I think that just stepping out on faith or whatever you're stepping out on um, and actually doing it, you might find that you actually do, for whatever reason, have somebody that is actually supporting you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why, that's why I like the technological tools that we have. That's why I like social media so much. Um, it's why I love blogging. It's why all these things are ways to get your voice and your perspective out there. I mean, you can create an anonymous account for yourself and push this information out if you're afraid of, of being you know, targeted at your workplace. Um, I, I mean, there's, there's levels to it, right? I mean, I worked at a museum when I started my blog, and nobody paid any attention to me at all. I mean, it was like, what's she doing? Whatever. But that was a place where I could just talk about whatever it is I wanted to talk about. And I was probably at it for a good two years before anyone even realized I had one. Yeah, I would say that <laughs> is like, that's like the benefit of being hyper visible and not visible at visible all. at the same like, time. There were several places that I worked where they clearly were not aware no. of my political stance they had at no all. no clue what I was doing. <laughs> As I'm sitting there, you know, registering children for class and then ready for my blog post over here. Like, they, they just did not know. But it was a way of saying, okay, I have something to say and I need to get it out here. And eventually the people that, that need that message that, that can commiserate with you will find you. And that's why I love social media because when I started museums, it was none of this. We didn't have, you know, Muse Social. We didn't have any of those chat, nothing. And when I found that, I was like, okay, here are my people. Here we are. And so gatherings like this are amazing because, you know, if you don't come out of this with, you know, at least one like-minded individual that you know you can just collaborate and get racked with, you're not doing it right. Like, come on. <laughs> like, you know, this is where you find your home. This is where you find the people that are going to help you push these ideas mm -hmm. out into the industry until it's so big that they can't ignore you. I mean, that's the thing. Um, but you can't do that by yourself. I think the first thing you have to do is realize that there's a problem. You have to recognize the problem. In order to recognize the problem, I think we have to go back to what we were talking about earlier. You have to be informed. Um, and you have to have a certain curiosity. Um, I think any bravery you know, requires curiosity. Uh, you have to be willing to peer in and see what's going on before you're willing to rush in. Um, but also, I mean, Bravery is an interesting concept. Um, I think it require. I think it's something that is a bit self-serving um, because we we want to feel brave. We want to feel like you know we we're doing something that 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 we may not otherwise be doing or that requires um, you know something something more something more from ourselves. Um, in some cases, that may be true, and I think that you know, I think we should regard it. I think it's easy to just say like, well, everyone should just be informed. Everyone mm -hmm. should be um, on top of the issues. Everyone should be trying to uh, diversify their staffs and to make sure that their um, that their workplaces are representative of all cultures and what have you. Everyone should be doing that, but it is not necessarily a natural thing for everyone to be doing that. So yeah, it does require some bravery, and especially in some work environments, it definitely requires some bravery and in order to make sure that you know, your, your museums are representative places. Mm -hmm. um, so embrace that. I, you know, I, like them, I, I mean, I started a blog when I was working, and I do it on the side and what have you, and now I get to be a journalist for a living. 
things do grow, things do blossom when you just start small. Mm -hmm. Small moves. You know, yeah, they say in contact, <laughs> small start. moves, you yeah. know, so you, but you have to start. Mm -hmm. You have to start. And you can't, you know, we could spend our whole lives being like, where do I start? Where do I start? Just start. Mm -hmm. Just start. And there are people in the room who are mid-level man mid managers, upper-level managers, who have people who report to them, too, and, and also can support those people who are starting mm -hmm. exactly. something, too, or reinforce or amplify yeah. that mm -hmm. message. Because there are other people within your organizations, guarantee you, who are no, thinking yeah. about the exact yeah. same things and maybe don't have as much um, direction or courage. Mm -hmm. Support them. Yeah. If, if, if it's not a move you make yourself, support them and help them try to do it. Because as a manager, you have to almost train yourself to be able to see and recognize when that is happening with the people that are working with you. Yep. Um, and, and we don't always have a very good way of, uh, in our field, I think, of training and, and educating people that, that grow from one position to another. You know, they're, they're kind of grandfathered into their classes, but they don't know how to be managers. They don't know how to do that. So if you are one of those, you know, upper or mid-level managers, you know, I would behoove you to go take some kind of cultural competency course and learn how to recognize when you see that talent and how to bring it up and develop it and promote it. And when you have opportunities to send people to trainings and to conferences, don't make it that only the upper level managers can go. Um, you have to, to put some kind of value behind mm -hmm. those people. Otherwise, they will find somewhere else to work. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you, like to read, you just have to start. You just have to do something. Um, and I, and I, I really, I get kind of icky when people say, oh, you're so brave. I'm like, listen, I'm just a black woman trying to live. If that's it. Um, that's not it necessarily a brave necessary thing. It's necessary. It's brave. a survival tactic. Mm -hmm. of any, it's not any kind of thing where I wake up and I go, I feel particularly brave today. No. <laughs> I'm literally just trying bravery, to stay like this, alive. This concept <laughs> yeah. of bravery is actually a privilege. Like yeah, for it's you really to privilege. be like, oh, I have to step outside of myself to look like, at someone else's issue. Nah. Like where. As for us, you gotta be it's careful with that very framework. real. You gotta be yeah. Careful with it. yeah, find the courage to do what people are courageous enough to do every day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You think about it like that, it's different. Um, we have a minute. Uh, please. <laughs> <laughs> if we have a minute, sure, whatever. We got the room all. We'll do whatever all we want today. <laughs> no, Trish, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's real. So, you know, I think, I, uh, I think that that should be a challenge as well. Oh, without oh, a doubt. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. it's extremely daunting. I'm not trying yeah. to make light of it at all. I mean, literally, when I tell you I fled my job, I literally quit in the middle of the night, went to the day, packed my stuff up, wrote a letter, stuck it in the office, and said, I am leaving. And that was, and I, I lived three hours away from my hometown. I mean, I had moved to an entirely part of the state. My husband had already left ahead of me to go back to Kansas City. I mean, we were like, we're getting out of here. So, I mean, that's scary stuff. And, I mean, that's, that's not, I'm not trying to make light of it at all. But, I mean, at some point, it's got to mean enough to you that you have to think about what am I willing to do. And it can be a smaller thing. I mean, it doesn't always have to be, I fled in the middle of the night. I mean, I'm just dramatic. <laughs> I mean, that's how fed up I was. It's like, I'm out of here. But in your case, you know I've got family, I've got responsibility. What's the smallest thing you can do that doesn't put everyone in peril? Do you know what I mean? But sometimes you have to risk it. It just depends on what it means to you. Yeah. I mean, and I don't fault anyone for taking various levels right. of risk. I mean, I'm all about calculated risk, risks that make sense. But and risks yeah. that don't harm that don't you harm you and your, your family. family. Yeah. Yeah, I'm very mm -hmm. big on that. I'm huge on that. I'm very it's big on that. Got to be a balance of that yeah. stuff. I mean, we do it every day. We make choices and and we evaluate our situations. Mm -hmm. And we go, okay, I can go big today, but tomorrow right. I might have to go a little small. I mean, we. I know this. I've worked in museums, mm -hmm. so like, you can't always be like super radical up at the front screaming. Sometimes it has to be more subtle work. Um, but yeah, I mean, th that anyone can do that, knowing what all you have to risk is inspiring to me and that's what makes me think that we can have hope and optimism. Yeah. 
because yeah. people are willing to risk something. I mean, me being in this body is a radical act. Going outside sometimes is a risky radical act. I don't always think of it that way, but it is. So someone who has a lot of privilege who's willing to do that with me, that's the that's co-conspirator. That's a co-conspirator. <laughs> that's who I want next to me. Right. You're willing to take these knocks just like I am? Or are you going to retreat into your comfort and privilege when it gets a little hot? I don't want you next to me because I can't do that. So, I mean, that's how I look at it, you know. All right, so uh, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank you guys for sort of keeping this uh, conversation going. Um, my, my takeaway is start, start somewhere and you can't do it all yourself. Uh, my takeaway is uh, start somewhere and you can't do it all yourself. I think those are just uh, great. Yeah. Um, and again, thanks everyone for making this um, sort of new format for the keynote, uh, I think, thank a success. You. Thank you for Great. skipping your networking. I yeah. Mean, <laughs> <laughs> um, you'll have uh, slow networking opportunities yes, for the next three yeah. days. <laughs> um, Do some slow yeah. networking. <laughs> so find those co-conspirators. Uh, yeah. And thank you. Thank you, you very much, everybody. Yes. Great.